this moment, 109 treasured human beings are being held hostage by Hamas in Gaza. They are Christians, Jews, Muslims, Hindus, and Buddhists. They are from 23 different countries. The youngest hostage is a one-year-old red-headed baby boy, and the oldest is an 86-year-old mustachioed grandpa. Among the hostages are eight American citizens. One of those Americans is our only son. His name is Hirsch. He's 23 years old. And like Vice President Kamala Harris, Hirsch was born in Oakland, California. Hirsch is a happy-go-lucky, laid-back, good-humored, respectful, and curious person. He is a civilian. He loves soccer, is wild about music and music festivals, and he has been obsessed with geography and travel since he was a little boy. His bedroom overflows with atlases, globes, maps, and National Geographic magazines. On October 7th, Hirsch and his best friend, Honor, went to a music festival in the south of Israel. It was advertised as celebrating peace, love, and unity. They also went to celebrate Hirsch's 23rd birthday. As rockets began to fall, Hirsch, Honor, and 27 other young festival goers took refuge in a five foot by eight foot bomb shelter. Terrorists began to throw grenades into the shelter. Aner stood in the doorway and repelled seven of those grenades before the eighth one killed him. All together at the Nova Music Festival, 367 young music lovers were killed. This was just one of the many attacks on neighborhoods and communities in southern Israel on that terrible day. In total, 1,200 were killed, including 45 Americans. Hirsch's left forearm, his dominant arm, was blown off before he was loaded onto a pickup truck and stolen from his life and me and John into Gaza. And that was 320 days ago. Since then, we live on another planet. Anyone who is a parent or has had a parent can try to imagine the anguish and misery that John and I and all the hostage families are enduring. Now you all know this. Trump betrays these ideals. He viciously attacks Democrats and Republicans. His put-downs know no shame. John McCain's military service, Nikki Haley's heritage, women, people with disabilities, trans people, our veterans. He is indiscriminate in his put-downs. His is the politics of smear and fear, not inspiration and elevation. Donald Trump speaks more of American carnage than American compassion. But in America, you can't lead the people if you don't love the people. All the people. On the other side of the border, the traffickers, they, pay, they pack migrants into 18-wheelers like cattle, 50, 100 at a time. Then they seal the doors. That's when the 911 calls come. We hear them, desperate, 
terrified, gasping for air. Now, sometimes we get there in time. Sometimes, despite our best efforts, we can't. When Donald Trump comes down to Texas, stands next to officers in uniforms just like mine, he's not there to help us. Don't think that, not for a second. He is a self-serving man. I mean, look, just like, just like when he killed the border bill, he just made our jobs harder. Now, Kamala, on the other hand, has been fighting border crime for years. She's gone down to Mexico and worked to stop the traffickers. And when the traffickers didn't stop, she put them in jail. Now, down in my neck of the woods, we call that fooling around and finding out. I may be paraphrasing a bit. We protect them. Now, the, the border sheriffs that I know, right, and I, we're like Kamala. We protect and serve. We enforce the law. We show compassion. And we fight like hell to protect our border. Because as we've all, we've all these known in Texas, cuando luchamos, ganamos. When we fight, we win. Four years ago, I resigned from the Trump administration. As a Republican who dreamed of working in the White House, it was a hard decision. But as an American, it was the right one. I saw how Donald Trump undermined our intelligence community, our military leaders, and ultimately our democratic process. Now, he's doing it again, lying and laying the groundwork to undermine this election. It's his MO to sow doubt and division. That's what Trump wants, because it's the only way he wins. And that's what our foreign adversaries want, because it's the only way they win. So let's get the hard part out of the way. I am a Republican. But tonight, I stand here as an American. An American that cares more about the future of this country than the future of Donald Trump. My journey started to this podium years ago when I realized Donald Trump was willing to lie, cheat, and steal to try to overturn the 2020 election. I realized Trump was a direct threat to democracy, and his actions disqualified him from ever, ever, ever stepping foot into the Oval Office again. I could spend my time revving up this crowd, but I'm certain I don't have to talk anybody out of voting for Donald Trump here. So I'm going to focus my attention on the millions of Republicans and independents that are at home that are sick and tired of making excuses for Donald Trump. If Republicans are being intellectually honest with ourselves, our party is not civil or conservative. It's chaotic and crazy, and the only thing left to do is dump Trump. These days, our party acts more like a cult, a cult worshiping a felonist thug. Look, you don't have to agree with every policy position of Kamala Harris. I don't. But you do have to recognize her prosecutor mindset that understands right from wrong, good from evil. She's a steady hand and will bring leadership to the White House that Donald Trump could never do. Let me be clear to my Republican friends at home watching. If you vote for Kamala Harris in 2024, you're not a Democrat, you're a patriot. But this year, this year I've prayed very hard for peace to come to our world's nations, but also to each one of our hearts. Even though our hearts have been beaten and broken, 
Beyond prayer, I know the importance of action, and now is the time to understand where we are and what it will take to win. Win the broken hearts. Win the disenchanted. Win the angry spirits. Now is the time. This is the moment to remember when you tell your children where you were and what you did. As we, as we stand between history's pain and tomorrow's promises, we must choose courage over complacency. It is time to get up and go back. What's up, DNC? Alright. Y'all remember this big old book from before? When Colorado Governor Jerry Polis ripped the page out of it? This is Project 2025. The Republican blueprint for a second Trump term. It is a, yeah, yeah, boo! <laughs> it is a real document that you can read for yourself at KamalaHarris.com forward slash Project 2025. You ever seen a document that could kill a small animal and democracy at the same time? My name is Mindy Kaling. Thank you. For those of you who don't know me, I am an incredibly famous Gen Z actress who you might recognize from The Office. Thank you, The Mindy Project. Or as the woman who courageously outed Kamala Harris as Indian in an Instagram cooking video. Yes, you're welcome. I am so proud to be here supporting my friend. But the real reason I am here is that deep down, I truly believe that as a woman of color and as a single mother of three, it is incredibly important that I be appointed ambassador to Italy. That's how this works, right? That's like why I'm here. I've never been, I'm dying to go. And guys, I just really need a break. Um, I know it's not the priority tonight, but just think about it. I am actually here because I have known the Vice President for a long time, and I want to tell you one, a story about one of the first times I ever met her. She wasn't Madam Vice President then. She was my senator, and we were filming a video where she came to my home to cook dosas, a South Indian dish. Yes. It's not every day that a senator comes over, and I was pretty nervous. But when she arrived, we immediately hit it off. We talked about the love we have for our moms, who had both passed away from cancer. Both of our mothers were immigrants from India who came to America and committed their lives to serving others. My mother, Swati, became an OBGYN. Thank you. <laughs> Kamala's mother, Shaimala, became a scientist with a PhD who dedicated her life to trying to find a cure for cancer. And after speaking to Kamala, it was clear to me that Shaimala had passed down the same optimism and fearlessness to her daughter. It's a high honor and a distinct privilege. As a Brooklynite, New Yorker, and as an American, to stand before you today and unequivocally express my support for Kamala Harris and Tim Walls to be the next President and Vice President of the United States of America. Over the last few years, House Democrats have been hard at work, and we could not have asked for a better leader to partner with than President Joseph Robinette Biden, who will go down as one of the most consequential presidents of all time. Last 
month, President Biden selflessly passed the torch to Vice President Kamala Harris, who is ready, willing, and able to fight for the people. After the last two days, aren't you proud to be a Democrat? And I am very grateful to the Republicans and independents that have joined us and been up here on the stage. And I hope they feel better about it now. Because I've seen all these things that even I have to be reminded of from time to time when I get my spirits down. I love seeing the Obamas here. I love seeing President Biden. <laughs> and. I thought Hillary gave a great speech, too. And, uh, I, love, but I, I love seeing all these young leaders. A bunch of them are coming up after me. They look better, they sound better, and they'll be exciting. I do want to say one word about President Biden. Remember, he had an improbable turn that made him president. And we were in the middle of a pandemic and an economic crash. He healed our sick and put the rest of us back to work. And He strengthened our alliances for peace and security. He stood up for Ukraine. He's trying desperately to get a ceasefire in the Middle East. And then he did something that's really hard for a politician to do. He voluntarily gave up political power. And George Washington knew that, and he did it. And he set the standard for us serving two terms before it was mandatory. It helped his legacy, and it will enhance Joe Biden's legacy. And you, and it's a stark contrast to what goes on in the other party. So I want to thank him for his courage, compassion, his class, his service, his sacrifice. And every four years, it's a little different because the people come at the candidates, come at the candidates, and they say, as they're saying now, here are our problems, solve them. Here are our opportunities. Seize them. Here are our fears. Ease them. Here are our dreams. Help them come true. A president can answer that call by saying, I'll do my part, but you have to help me. We have to work together. Or you can dodge what needs to be done by dividing, distracting, and diverting us. So in 2024, we got a pretty clear choice, it seems to me. Kamala Harris, for the people, And the other guy who's proved even more than the first go around that he's about me, myself, and I. On January 20th, 2021, with the inauguration of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, we established one of the most successful presidencies of modern times.
And we pr quickly proved that Democrats deliver. Millions of jobs, stronger infrastructure and rural broadband, a, a Biden child tax credit, rescuing human pensions, honoring our veterans, bold climate action, lowering the cost of prescription drugs, all thanks to President Biden's patriotic vision of a fairer America, doing so with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Joe. And I know that Vice President Harris is ready to take us to new heights. Two and a half centuries ago, in Philadelphia, a band of patriots declared their independence from a king and set ourselves on a path of self-determination. Generation after generation has embraced that responsibility. Ordinary Americans rising up, demanding more, seeking justice. And in every chapter of our American story, we've made progress and advanced the cause of freedom. Today, well, today we find ourselves writing that next chapter. Will we be a nation defined by chaos and extremism? Or will we choose a path of decency, honor, and continued progress? Kamala Harris, well, she has spent her entire career making progress. Donald Trump, a man with no guardrails, wants to take away our rights and our freedoms. And listen, while he cloaks himself in the blanket of freedom, what he's offering isn't freedom at all. Because hear me on this, it's not freedom to tell our children what books they're allowed to read. No, it's not. And it's not freedom to tell women what they can do with their bodies. And hear me on this, it sure as hell isn't freedom to say, you can go vote, but he gets to pick the winner. That's not freedom. Who says you can't go home again? After watching the Obamas last night, that was some epic fire, wasn't it? Some epic fire. We're now so fired up, we can't wait to leave here and do something. And what we're gonna do is elect Kamala Harris as the next president of the United States. I am so honored to have been asked to speak on tonight's theme about what matters most to me, to you, and all of us Americans, freedom. There are people who want you to see our country as a nation of us against them, people who want to scare you, who want to rule you, people who'd have you believe that books are dangerous and assault rifles are safe, that there's a right way to worship and a wrong way to love, people who seek first to divide and then to conquer. But here's the thing. When we stand together, it is impossible to conquer us. In the words of an extraordinary American, the late Congressman John Lewis, He said, no matter what ship our ancestors arrived on, we are all in the same boat now. <laughs> Congressman Lewis knew very well how far this country has come.
because he was one of the brilliant Americans who helped to get us where we are. But he also knew that the work is not done, the work will never be done because freedom isn't free. America is an ongoing project. It requires commitment. It requires being open to the hard work and the heart work of democracy. And every now and then, it requires standing up to life's bullies. I know this. I've lived in Mississippi, in Tennessee, in Wisconsin, Maryland, Indiana, Florida, Hawaii, Colorado, California, and s California. And sweet home Chicago, Illinois. have actually traveled this country from the redwood forests, love those redwoods, to the Gulf Stream waters. I've seen racism and sexism and income inequality and division. I've not only seen it, at times I've been on the receiving end of it. But more often than not, what I've witnessed and experienced are human beings, both conservative and liberal, who may not agree with each other, but who'd still help you in a heartbeat if you were in trouble. These are the people who make me proud to say that I am an American. They are the best of America. And despite what some would have you think, we are not so different from our neighbors. When a house is on fire, we don't ask about the homeowner's race or religion. We don't wonder who their partner is or how they voted, no. We just try to do the best we can to save them. And if the place happens to belong to a childless cat lady, Well, we try to get that cat out too. <laughs> I want to talk now about somebody who's not with us tonight. Tessie Prevost Williams was born in New Orleans not long after the Supreme Court ruled that segregated public schools were unconstitutional. That was in 1954, same year I was born. But I didn't have to head to first grade at the all-white Madonna 19 school with a U.S. Marshal by my side like Tessie did. And when I got to school, the building wasn't empty like it was for Tessie. You see, rather than allowing Madonna to be integrated, parents pulled their kids out of the school, leaving only Tessie and two other little black girls, Gail Etienne and Leona Tate, to sit in a classroom with the windows papered over to block snipers from attacking their six-year-old bodies. Tessie passed away six weeks ago. And I tell this story to honor her tonight because she She, like Ruby Bridges and her friends, Leona and Gail, the New Orleans Four, they were called. They broke barriers and they paid dearly for it. But it was the grace and guts and courage of women like Tessie Prevost Williams that paved the way for another young girl who nine years later became part of the second class to integrate the public schools in Berkeley, California. And it seems to me that at school and at home, somebody did a beautiful job of showing this young girl how to challenge the people at the top 
and empower the people at the bottom. They showed her how to look at the world and see not just what is, but what can be. They instilled in her a passion for justice and freedom and the glorious fighting spirit necessary to pursue that passion. And soon and very soon, And very soon, we're going to be teaching our daughters and sons about how this child of an Indian mother and a Jamaican father, two idealistic, energetic immigrants, immigrants, how this child grew up to become the 47th president of the United States. You this. This election isn't about us and them. It's about you and me and what we want our futures to look like. There are choices to be made when we cast our ballot. Now, there's a certain candidate that says if we just go to the polls this one time, <laughs> that we'll never have to do it again. Well, you know what? You're looking at a registered independent who's proud to vote again and again and again because I'm an American and that's what Americans do. <laughs> Voting is the best of America. And I have always, since I was eligible to vote, I've always voted my values. And that is what is needed in this election now more than ever. So I'm calling on all you independents and all you undecideds. You know this is true. You know I'm telling you the truth, that values and character matter most of all. in leadership and in life. And more than anything, you know this is true, that decency and respect are on the ballot in 2024. Let us choose. Let us choose truth. Let us choose honor. And let us choose joy. And I know our history is imperfect. The unevenness of the American journey has made some skeptical. But I'm not asking you to give up your skepticism. I just want that skepticism to be your companion and not your captor. And I'm asking that you join us in the work. Because making America great doesn't mean telling people you're not wanted. And loving your country does not mean lying about its history. Making America great means saying the ambitions of this country would be incomplete without your help. It's the legacy of those six workers who fixed potholes on a bridge while we slept, who were born in a different country, but who knew that America was big enough for them too. Here's a sentence I never thought I'd hear myself saying. I'm Pete Buttigieg, and you might recognize me from Fox News. I believe in going anywhere, anywhere, in service of a good cause, and friends, we gather in a very good cause, electing Kamala Harris and Tim Walz the next President and Vice President of the United States. The choice could not be clearer. Donald Trump rants about law and order. 
as if he wasn't a convicted criminal running against a prosecutor. As if we were going to forget that crime was higher on his watch. Talks about the forgotten man hoping we'll forget that the only economic promise that he actually kept was to cut taxes for the rich. And don't even get me started on his new running mate. At least Mike Pence was polite. J.D. Vance is one of those guys who thinks if you don't live the life that he has in mind for you, then you don't count. Someone who said that if you don't have kids, you have, quote, no physical commitment to the future of this country. You know, Senator, when I deployed to Afghanistan, I didn't have kids then. Many of the men and women who went outside the wire with me didn't have kids either, but let me tell you, our commitment to the future of this country was pretty damn physical. On behalf of the great state of Minnesota, where purple reigns, I stand before you in support of our next Vice President, Tim Walls. Thank you. Thank you, first of all, to Vice President Harris. Thanks for putting your trust in me and for inviting me to be part of this incredible campaign. And a thank you to President Joe Biden for four years of strong, historic leadership. It's, it's the honor of my life to accept your nomination for Vice President of the United States. Now, I grew up in Butte, Nebraska, a town of 400 people. I had 24 kids in my high school class, and none of them went to Yale. But I'll tell you what. Growing up in a small town like that, you learn how to take care of each other. That, that family down the road, they may not think like you do. They may not pray like you do. They may not love like you do. But they're your neighbors. And you look out for them. And they look out for you. Everybody belongs and everybody has a responsibility to contribute. For me, it was serving in the Army National Guard. I joined up two days after my 17th birthday, and I proudly wore our nation's uniform for 24 years. My dad, a Korean War era Army veteran, died of lung cancer a couple years later. He left behind a mountain of medical debt. Thank God for Social Security survivor benefits. And thank God for the GI Bill that allowed my dad and me to go to college and millions of other Americans. Eventually, like the rest of my family, I fell in love with teaching. Three, three out of four of us married teachers. I wound up teaching social studies and coaching football at Mankato West High School. Go Scarlets! We ran, we ran a 44 defense. We played through to the whistle on every single play and we even won a state championship. Never close the yearbook, people. But it was those players and my students 
who inspired me to run for Congress. They saw in me what I had hoped to instill in them, a commitment to the common good, an understanding that we're all in this together, and the belief that a single person can make a real difference for their neighbors. So there I was, a 40-something high school teacher with little kids, zero political experience, and no money running in a deep red district. But you know what? Never underestimate a public school teacher. Never. Take Donald Trump and J.D. Vance. Their project 2025 will make things much, much harder for people who are just trying to live their lives. They spent a lot of time pretending they know nothing about this. But look, I coached high school football long enough to know and trust me on this. When somebody takes the time to draw up a playbook, they're gonna use it. And, and we know if these guys get back in the White House, they'll start jacking up the costs on the middle class, they'll repeal the Affordable Care Act, they'll gut Social Security and Medicare, and they will ban abortion across this country with or without Congress. Here's the thing, it's an agenda nobody asked for. It's an agenda that serves nobody except the richest and the most extreme amongst us. And it's an agenda that does nothing for our neighbors in need. Is it weird? Absolutely. Absolutely. But it's also wrong. And it's dangerous. It's not just me saying so. It's Trump's own people. They were with him for four years. They're warning us that the next four years will be much, much worse. You know, when I was teaching every year, we'd elect a student body president. And you know what? Those teenagers could teach Donald Trump a hell of a lot about what a leader is. <laughs> Leaders don't spend all day insulting people and blaming others. Leaders do the work. So I don't know about you, I'm ready to turn the page on these guys. So go ahead, say it with me. We're not going back. We've got something better to offer the American people. It starts with our candidate, Kamala Harris. From her first day as a prosecutor, as a district attorney, as an attorney general, as a United States senator, and then our vice president, she's fought on the side of the American people. She's taken on the predators and fraudsters. She's taken down the transnational gangs, and she stood up to powerful corporate interest. She has never hesitated to reach across that aisle if it meant improving your lives. And she's always done it with energy, with passion, and with joy. <laughs> Folks, we've got a chance to make Kamala Harris the next president of the United States. But I think we owe it to the American people to tell them exactly what she'd do as president before we ask them for their votes. So here, this is the part, clip and save it and send it to your undecided relatives so they know. If you're a middle class family or a family trying to get into the middle class, Kamala Harris is gonna cut your taxes. If you're getting squeezed by prescription drug prices, Kamala Harris is gonna take on Big Pharma. If you're hoping to buy a home, Kamala Harris is gonna help make it more affordable. And no matter who you are, Kamala Harris is gonna stand up and fight for your freedom to live the life that you want to lead. Because that's what we want for ourselves and it's what we want for our neighbors. You know, you might not know it, but I haven't given a lot of big speeches like this. 
but I have given a lot of pep talks. <laughs> so let me, let me finish with this team. It's the fourth quarter. We're down a field goal, but we're on offense and we've got the ball. We're driving down the field. And boy, do we have the right team. Kamala Harris is tough. Kamala Harris is experienced, and Kamala Harris is ready. Our job, our job, our job, our job for everyone watching is to get in the trenches and do the blocking and tackling. One inch at a time, one yard at a time, one phone call at a time, one door knock at a time, one $5 donation at a time. Look, we got 76 days. That's nothing. There'll be time to sleep when you're dead. We're going to leave it on the field. That's how we'll keep moving forward. That's how we'll turn the page on Donald Trump. That's how we'll build a country where workers come first. Health care and housing are human rights. And the government stays the hell out of your bedroom. That's how we make America a place where no child is left hungry, where no community is left behind, where nobody gets told they don't belong. That's how we're going to fight. And as the next President of the United States always says, when we fight, we when we fight,